I love baseball analogies because I'm, I'm a Yankees fan, as you all know. <laughs> Boo, yeah. T 27 titles isn't all that bad, right? I know you're all jealous. But um, <laughs> baseball. When, when a baseball team is, is desperate, when they've done all they can do, they put on a rally cap. They take their hats, they turn it inside out, like that picture right there. And I want to kind of go through real fast the history of the rally cap. In the 1940s, the D Detroit Tigers, okay, started that. Sorry about, about your team, by the way, there, Tom. Uh, they started in 1940s. Two guys started doing it, and no one cared. In 1977-78, the Rangers started doing it, and no one cared. But those two years, the Yankees won the World Series, by the way. So I did care, okay? Then in 1986, the New York Mets. The Miracle Mets, right? That team, they finished 21 and a half games up in first place. They won and won big. They had some amazing players. That team was crazy good, right? They hit the playoffs, and the Boston Red Sox hate the Red Sox. They're playing the Red Sox, and they're, they're down three games to two at Shea Stadium, 10th inning, down by two runs. There's not a chance. Two outs, two strikes, not a prayer, right? And the guys turn their hats inside out, put the baseballs on there, and a few guys like Keith Hernandez were in the locker room making phone calls to make plane reservations to fly back home. They were done. They were finished. They were done, right? Then, all of a sudden, Mookie Wilson hits a ground ball to first base, goes through Bill Buckner's legs. I was cheering, okay? Through his legs, two runs score, the Mets win game six, come back and win game seven, the Miracle Mets, they still won the World Series, right? So they were, in, in, but in desperation, they put on the rally caps. But what do you do in your faith when you're desperate? What do you do when you've done everything you can do, but you're desperate? This sermon came out of Cindy Ferguson's word, God's word, about two months ago. About two months back, Cindy, Holy Spirit through Cindy, said something to the effect, you know, when you've done all you can do, and the, the dancer today, that song blew me away. It's the same song. It was about when you've done all you can do. I did not know that. They didn't know this, right? But when you've done all you can do, the Holy Spirit said, he said, stand. And Cindy paused, and I believe you said every single word you're given. I believe that entirely, okay? Right? And Cindy p says, stand, pauses and says, stand. I went, there's, more that, there, there's more than that somewhere. There, there's something that God didn't download, right? It was, it was bugging me. And I went home and I prayed about it. I said, God, well, how do you want me to stand, <laughs> right? You said, if you've done all you can do, just stand. Well, how do you want me to stand, right? You stand tall. You stand firm. You stand strong. You stand on his word. But mostly you stand in faith. You stand in faith. So this sermon is based off of that word that the Holy Spirit gave to Cindy, that you stand in faith. And I want to go through some things about faith, about desperate faith. When you've done all you can do, this church has done all it can do. What do you do? You stand in faith. So we're going to go through some things real fast. Let's start with first, what is the definition of faith? What, what, what does faith mean when you hear faith? And I want to do the school teacher thing and do the real simple, what is faith? And the definition of faith based upon his word is now, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of we do not see. The Allen translation is when you have no fuzzy, hairy idea how God's going to do something, but you believe in your heart without doubting He's going to do it. That's what faith is. And if, and if you knew how He was going to do it, then that wouldn't be faith, which is why you don't know how He's going to do it. Now, the Bible says it is impossible to please Him without faith. So it makes sense, it stands to reason, He's going to give you things to be faithful about that you will not see how He's going to do it, because then it wouldn't be faith. Right? So, now, I want to go through a couple of things real fast. Today is Veterans Day, and thank you if you've been in the military. I know Keith has, right? The military? Yes? So, yeah, so, so thank you for the military. To join the military is a special kind of person. I don't think I can do that. I, I, know, I know I couldn't do that, right? To me, camping is the Holiday Inn, right, with the pools outside. So I, you, would, you, would not, you would not want me in the military, okay? So, but the second that you accept Christ's blood, the second that you, you say you're his, the second by faith you believe he died on the cross for you, the second you do that, you have joined God's army. I'm sorry, but you have. 
You've enlisted in his army. And that's why I have the shield, Captain America. He was a pretty cool, you know, veteran kind of guy, you know, and he has the shield. Ephesians 6.10 says God's given you a whole bunch of armor. You know, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the girdle of truth, feet shod with the preparation of the gospel, the sword of the spirit, and the shield of faith. And I want to go through some things about the shield of faith today, okay? This shield is used. This shield has marks on it. This shield has Hulk blood, Wolverine claws, bullet holes. This shield has been used in battle. As a Christian, by default, in his army, you two are in battle. Your shield, the day you either die or are raptured, your shield should look like this. If your shield is pristine and clean and perfect and polished, then Satan does not see you as a threat to, to, you know, to him. It just doesn't. If you can tell me there are no issues in your life, there are no burdens, no concerns, no problems, I don't know what Bible you're reading, but mine says to expect it. Okay, so if yours is polished, Satan does not see you as a risk. Okay, so now look, look at it this way. Romans 5 says that your suffering brings perseverance. It, that means it pushes you closer and closer and closer to him. Perseverance. And, and that brings character, which makes you more and more like him. See, it's not what happens to you, it's what happens inside of you. Okay, so you become more and more like him, which creates hope. Why do you have hope? Because you know him more. You've pushed towards him, become more like him. You know him and his character better. So you trust in him and that becomes in turn faith, right? Now, if the, uh, Hebrews 10.38 says that the righteous live by faith. And when you shrink back in your, in your faith, he takes no pleasure in that. Now, I want you to understand too, is that when you go through stuff, when things hit your shield and God takes care of you, and in Galatians 5.22 it says, we have the fruit of the Spirit, right? Joy, love, peace, patience, goodness, gentleness, kindness, uh, all those things that God gives you, self-control, right? When people see that, what do you become? You become His witness. Now follow this logic. You're holding up your shield to you go through stuff. People see what you go through. They see all the marks on your armor. And they see you with joy, love, peace, goodness, kindness. That is a testimony to your faith. It makes you a witness for Him. Understand? Now, the next part of this little thing is going to kind of blow your mind a little bit. In Acts 1.8, the Lord promises to send His helper. Now, now, follow this, right? Christ is here, and he's, he dies, and he's buried, resurrected. The disciples are freaking out, right? He reappears, spends 40 days hanging around, talking to people. He's about to ascend. And the disciples are freaking out, like, where are you going, dude? We need you, right? We need you. He says, no, no, no. I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. I'm going to send you a helper. Okay? So he's now telling them what he's going to do. And he says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria to, and to the end of the earth. Now, I want to read it again a little bit, okay? But you'll receive power. Now, that word in Greek is dunamis, and dunamis means strength or ability, which means that when things hit your shield, when things attack you and assault you, because you've got a big bullseye on your back, right? The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. If you're in his army, he's coming after you, okay? But he promises power, strength, or ability to get through what's hitting your shield. Now follow this. And he says, and, and. In some translations, it's therefore, and. I will send power to deal with this stuff, and, or therefore, you will be my witnesses. So he sent you the Holy Spirit for you to be his witness. He sends problems, difficulties, trials, tribulations, so you could be his witness. Witness, okay? That's why these things come, so you could be his witness. Now what I want to do is, the next slide, go ahead. Leo. 
What I want to do is go through uh, four examples in the Gospel of Matthew of desperate faith, of extreme faith, of people that had to show faith beyond, beyond the pale to receive from him, okay? So remember, okay, you were sent to be his witness, and these four examples become his witness. Now, the Canaanite lady, right, she was, the Jewish folks didn't like the Canaanites, right? God told the Israelites to wipe them all out. It never happened, right? So the Jewish people did not like the Canaanites, and even in Christ's time, they weren't big fans of the Canaanites, and wish they just got rid of them, okay? This is the only example in all of Matthew of a female who, of a Gentile female, who received a miracle from him. Okay, so I want to go through this. I'm going to read through the story of the Canaanite woman. A Canaanite woman came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon possessed and suffering terribly. So like any mom would, kids suffering, mom's seeking an answer. Okay, and he's recognizing who the answer is. He, she recognized, Lord, son of David. Okay. Jesus did not answer her words, so his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. Now, like Michael Rowan said a few weeks back about the disciples, they're hanging out with Jesus, right? Okay, they're hanging out with Jesus, and they say, shoo, you're a Canaanite. You're not a Jew. He's with us. Go, right? He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. She persevered persevered. He replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the, to the dogs. Yes, it is, Lord, she said. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. She's saying, look, you're a god. You're a king of the universe. I'll take whatever you give me. My daughter's sick and suffering. I'll take whatever you throw my way. Then Jesus said to her, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. Now, he said, you have great faith. Don't forget who was there with him. The disciples were there with him. He told them five times, you have little faith. And here's a Canaanite. And he's saying to her, you have great faith. What made it a great faith? She persevered and pushed and gnawed her way to the king, knowing that he was the only one that could save her child. Right? She had great faith and persevered. Now, the woman with the issue of the blood, she spent, if you read all the different accounts of her, of her story, she spent 12 years suffering. And if you know about the Jewish people, if you were unclean, it was, it was seven days you couldn't be with people. Right? Seven days you're unclean. So for 12 years she was unclean. Couldn't be with anybody. And the Gospels say that she spent all of her money seeking doctors and medical advice, and she had no hope but him. And that was all she, that was all she had. And she pushed her way towards him. While he was saying this, a synagogue leader came and knelt before him and said, My daughter has just died, but come and put your hand on her and she will live. Jesus got up and went with him and so did his, his disciples. So don't forget, everyone's following him around town, right? Just then a, a woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. She said to herself, If I only touch his cloak, I will be healed. Now stop right there. She pushed her way through a crowd to get to him because she knew he was the only answer. Nothing else could help her. He was the only answer. A few weeks back, I was back there and I told um, Greg Carver, I said, look, I'm going to take the day off from doing the prayer. The Holy Spirit told me to, to sit back and just stay, stay back there. He said, okay, that's great. And I'm back there doing, doing worship and I heard something in my head, in my ear, I don't know what it was, but I heard altar. I just heard altar. I mean, I beelined it right here. Because I'll go wherever he tells me he is. Right? I will push my way to him. Wherever he says he is, I'm going there. I beelined it right here. And if you were all here that day, I couldn't get up. I was hit so hard. I tried five or six times to stand. They were doing communion around me. The com communion, they're doing, they're singing, they're, they're doing money. I don't know what they're doing. I couldn't get up. I tried five times to get up, and I couldn't. I couldn't. Right? And I want you to understand something. All of us have stuff. I've got stuff. My wife's got stuff. And it's personal stuff between us and him. But we've got stuff. Right? And I will go wherever he says he is. And there was one time I was, I was wanting to God about my stuff. And I'm like, well, how are you getting glory for this? 
no one knows. How are you getting glory? He said to me, every demon in hell knows and I'm getting glory. So even if your stuff's personal and no one knows, every demon in hell knows what you're going through. And when I lift my hands, when I praise His name, when I come here and pray for people, when I preach, when I spread the word, when I acknowledge Him as God, as King, my family does not believe in Christ. When we stand up to them, every demon in hell knows, and God knows, and He is getting glory. I don't care what you're going through, God knows, the angels know, the demons know. He is getting glorified by what you're going through. Amen. Jesus turned and saw her. Take heart, daughter, he said. Your faith, your faith has healed you. And the woman at that moment was healed. Your faith has healed you. It's not anything she did. It wasn't going to church. It wasn't reading the Bible. Those were all important things. It wasn't her tithing, which again is an important thing. It wasn't how nice or kind she was. It was her faith. It is impossible to please him without faith. Faith healed her. It's the only thing that healed her was her faith. When Jesus entered the synagogue's leader's house, because they're still walking around town, they're they going to the house now, and saw the noisy crowd and people playing pipes, he said, go away. The girl is not dead but asleep. But they laughed at him. Remember, the elders, the, the, um, the, the priests from the, the temple were all right there. The Jewish leaders were right there. And they mocked him. They laughed at him. After the crowd had been put outside, that's important. After the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took the girl by the hand. And she got up. News of this spread throughout all that region. The mockers, the laughers were put outside. The mockers and laughers were put outside. My wife and I come to this church for a lot of reasons. I can give you a long list. But one of the biggest reasons is that I don't want to be outside when a miracle happens here. When this church grows and it expands, I don't want to be outside saying, man, I should have stayed there. I believe and I stay here because I believe. And I don't want to be the outside laughing, mocking when something amazing happens in this building. Right. Jesus heals a blind man. Um, this part, God gave me to say, literally. He, he gave me this part. Because there was, at one point, I had nothing for this slide. And I went to bed one night and he gave it to me. Um, he opens eyes every single day, not just the physical. He opens spiritual eyes every single day. I don't care how new or how old you are in the faith. He opens eyes every single day. And he gave me a dream. He gave me a dream how there are people in this church, I don't, and I don't know who you are, I really have no idea, but there are people in this church that he's speaking to repeatedly, over and over and over. And your eyes are opening, but you're afraid. Your spiritual eyes are opening, but yet you're scared. He says, have faith. Have faith. Step forward. Move your feet. He will provide and take care of you, but move your feet. He can't move your feet for you. He can show you where to, where to, where to place them and how you, where to go, but you have to move your feet in obedience to Him. He's going to give you the faith you need. In Acts 1, he said to you, He's going to give you that power that you need. Strength, ability. He's going to give it to you. Move your feet forward. It's okay to be afraid, but it's not okay to stand still. As Jesus went on from there, two blind men followed him, calling out, Have mercy on us, son of David. When he got indoors, the blind men came to him, and they, he asked them, Do you believe? Do you believe that I'm able to do this? Do you believe? All things are possible to those who believe. When, when Christ was called to go take care of his friend Lazarus, he had been very sick and he had died. And they asked for him for many days. Four days go by. And he comes to the tomb and Martha, and he says to them, roll away the stone. Roll it away. And Martha's like, dude, you kidding me? He stinks. All right? He's been, there, he's been dead for days. What are you talking about? And he says, did I not tell you? If you just believe, you will see the glory of God. 
If you just believe. Or he's in Matthew 21, 21, it says, when you pray, believe that you will receive this. Do not doubt in your heart. Believe you will receive this. Believe. If you just believe, you'll see the glory of God. He asked the Lord, Lord, they replied. Then he touched their eyes and said, according to your faith, let it be done to you. To me, those as a Christian, as a saved Christian, those are the scariest words of the entire Bible. According to your faith, let it be done to you. As a Christian, that should scare you beyond measure. According to your faith, let it be done to you. How big is your God? Do you believe He can save your marriage? Do you believe He can pay your bills? Do you believe He can get you a great job? Do you believe He can re restore this church? Do you believe He can touch your body? Do you believe that you're saved? I met one guy last week at school who's a parent, and uh, I don't think he believes he's saved. That's a problem. That's a big problem. According to your faith, let it be done to you. Is anything too hard for me, he says. No, nothing's too hard for him. The faith of the centurion. Look, he was a Roman soldier. Uh, I don't think Roman soldiers and Jews got along so well. I'm just saying. Uh, they killed over a million of them. More than that. There's plenty of, of Jewish blood at the hands of the Roman soldiers. Plenty of them. And here's this Roman soldier seeking after a Jewish God for an answer he needed. Right? Let's go through this account here. The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes. And that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. What he tells us. Christ tells us to do things, doesn't he? Is, are you under his authority? When Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those following him, Truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. Now stop there for a second. Don't forget who's following him. All the leaders, all the priests, all the folks in the temple, they're following him. And he's saying, I've not found anyone in all of Israel with such great faith. Well, why is he saying that? Because the Jewish folk believe you get to heaven if there, if there is one by what you do. More good than more bad, you know, more good than bad, and you're okay, right? It's about what you do, about the law and following the law and doing things, things legally. He's saying, no, 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 no. It's not the law or what you do, it's who you believe in. Right? It's the faith you place in Him that saves you. See, it makes sense. It makes sense that if your faith saves you, your faith should also heal you, should also restore you, should also deliver you, your faith. See, we're in a faith-based system. You're saved by your faith, and you're healed by your faith. And he goes on to mention, he says, I say to you that many will come from the east and the west, and will take their places at the feast, of, the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. He's telling them, look, there's a hell. And it, the only thing that will save you is faith in me, and that's it. <laughs> God does not send sinners to hell. He doesn't. He sends sin to hell. Now, don't forget this, okay? Sin cannot enter eternity. It can't enter into heaven. If sin enters heaven, it'll corrupt heaven. So sin can't enter. There's only one way to remove sin from you. That's by His grace, believing in Him. That's the only way. Okay, and if it's still attached to you, that sin is sent to hell. I'm sorry it's attached to you, but the way you gain entry is by belief in Him as King Messiah. That's it. That's the only way. By faith in Him, him and His blood. Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go, let it be done just as you believed it would. The second scariest sentence in the entire Bible. Go, let it be done just as as you believed it would. When you witness, do you believe they're going to receive from the Holy Spirit? When you witness, do you believe God's going to speak for you and through you? When you pray, do you believe God's going to answer your prayer? When you tithe, do you believe God's going to take that money and use it for the, for the kingdom? Go as just as you believed it would. Your marriage, your family, your kids being saved. Finances, jobs, careers, go just as you believed it would. 
Do not doubt in your heart. Believe when you pray that you shall receive what you're praying for. There are three common things throughout all these stories. First, each one recognized Messiah as Lord. Now, that's kind of deep, actually. It's not just saying, yeah, you're God, I believe in you. It's putting him first in everything. The first two of the Ten Commandments are about putting him first in everything. And Pastor Max's uh, scripture today, about seek the kingdom first of righteousness, uh, and his righteousness and all the rest is added to you, that's what I got last night praying about for today. That's what I was given last night to say today, and he did it for me. Okay? If you want to receive from him, you better place him first in everything. First, not second, first. Number two. Each had been healed by a great faith shaped with dire circumstance. Great faith is shaped oftentimes in desperation. And God might put you back against a wall just to create strong faith in you to be his witness. His witness. And did you know also, Mark 16, 17, it says, And these signs follow those who believe. When you pray for somebody else, they might not believe at all. But why is there healing? Why is there deliverance? Because the one praying believes. So when we say, lift a person up in prayer, you're literally holding up by your faith. Your faith is supporting them. The faith that was shaped through trial and tribulation, that was tr shaped by fire, that faith is holding up somebody else. Otherwise, how do witches find salvation? They don't believe in anything that's, that's holy. Right? It's the faith of somebody else. So when, when you are praying for somebody else, you're lifting them up by your faith. That faith that was under fire. That faith holds up somebody else. Three, each worshipped him as an act of surrender. Each one fell to their feet. They each fell to their feet and said, You're God. You're king. You rule the universe. Whatever you want to do is fine. I'll accept whatever it is that you decide. But you're my God. You're my king. I acknowledge you. I worship you. I worship you as my king. Whatever you decide, I will deal with. I'm not saying through all of this, you don't have because you don't believe. And I'm not saying you're not believing hard enough so you don't have. I'm not saying believe harder. That's, that's not my point. That's not the point. What I am saying is God is calling all of us to a higher level of belief or a higher level of faith, a higher level of obedience, a higher level of worship, a higher level of putting him first. That's what I am saying. Putting him first to increase your level of belief is what I am saying. Look, the, the Apostle Paul, he uh, had a thorn in his flesh. And he prayed three times, God, take this away. Please take it away. And God said no. Why? Because that thorn helped him remember who was his king and, and depend upon God. It forced dependence upon him. So I don't know what your thorn is. I can guarantee you have one. We all have one. I don't know what your thorn is. And I can't tell you that God's going to take away your thorn. I don't know how he's going to answer your prayer. I don't know how he's going to manage what you're going through. But I can tell you. I can tell you, Acts 1.8, he will give you the strength, the power, and the ability you need to get through whatever it is you are going through. In Romans 12.3, he says, he's given us a measure of faith. And I'm sorry, also, can Al come up with the worship band, please? Al, where's Al? There's Al. I forgot that part. In Ro Romans 12.3, he says, he's given us a measure of faith. He's already given you a measure of faith. He is the author and finisher of our faith. He is writing our faith. He's already given you the amount of faith you need to get through whatever it is you're going through. He's already handed it to you. He's promised it to you to give you the faith you need. Some people question, well, I don't have enough faith in the faith he's given me. Do you believe? Do you believe? If you just believe, I told you, told you, you'll see the glory of God. I don't have any great challenges or things to put in front of you that have come up here, or any tricks or anything like that. All I have to offer you is Jesus. That's all I got. It's all you need. <laughs> 
All I have to offer you is him. That's all. I don't have any roses. I don't have any funny challenges. All I have is Jesus. So I say to you today, if you've got a thorn, and we all have thorns, every demon in hell knows your thorn. But when you rejoice, when you sing, when you praise him, when you worship him and put him first, and you seek him, and you push your way towards him, every demon trembles. So I do challenge you today, if you need more of Jesus, and you want to touch his cloak and be at his feet, he's here. All I have is Jesus.